Hello, welcome to this presentation. How do I IA? Information architecture for effective design and improved user experience. My name is Chad Hester. I am an enterprise technical consultant and solutions architect. I've been a web developer for over 20 years, working with Drupal for over 12 years, and an information architect, UX strategist for over 10 years. I'm an advocate for open source software and user experience, community participation and learning. A few acronyms before we get started. Information architecture, IA, user experience, UX, user interface, UI, key performance integrator, KPI, performance measurement framework, PMF. So is this a presentation for you? Well, in this presentation, we plan to answer what is information architecture? How does information architecture impact user experience and design? How do you create an effective information architecture or improve an existing information architecture? It's important to understand that this presentation is neither comprehensive nor reductive of the effort involved. Great information architecture is detected, not invented. Use an experienced information architect for information architecture work. So what is information architecture? Well, the information architecture for the worldwide, for the web and beyond book defines it as a design discipline that is focused on making information findable and understandable. So why information architecture? Well, it's a major component of user experience design. User research and testing with rapid prototypes improves success. Good information architecture accommodates changing needs and decreases technical debt inherited by old systems. Modern design improves performance and credibility. Thoughtful information architecture parts may be hidden from view yet support user needs. So suffice it to say that if you want to improve your system, whether it's a website or digital interface or even a live interface, improving information architecture can improve a person's experience. So there are five key points of information architecture. That is the content structure, how it is that data points are defined with fields, relationships, Taxonomy, that is the way we classify things. Labeling, the words that we choose to use. Navigation, how we move throughout a system. And search, how we use some sort of search facility to find something very specific. So consider an event page, it's information parts. Maybe there are speakers at an event, a location, dates. Having structure to this gives us the ability to see these parts on pages, search results, and other contextual moments, whether it's a calendar or other things. Any type of content structure is very helpful. And those relationships with other things, perhaps a speaker or a conference center or something like that, comes into play with how a person tries to find information to inform decisions or just learn something. Taxonomy is how things are classified how things are grouped. That helps with better context and retrieval. Labeling systems is all about the words that you choose to use based on what it is that your audience recognizes. They don't recognize it. It may not have the meaning that you hope. Navigation strategy is often activity-based. So a verb, what am I doing? What can I do? How do I select something? That includes global, local, contextual, and supplemental navigation items designed to guide your audience to information. You may recognize that as a main menu or a secondary menu that's just in a section of a website. Contextual navigation, that might be links inside of a body or related products or content. And then supplemental navigation is things like a directory or a sitemap. Search strategy is also very important. If your audience knows exactly what they're looking for, well, why 
hamper their ability to find it with convoluted navigation or something that gets in their way. Providing reliable search options is very helpful. And all five of these points work together. If we neglect one, it hampers the others. So how does information architecture impact user experience and design? Well, let's first take a look at one of the most common complaints that we hear about things like websites not working. Well, a lot of times it's, I cannot find what I'm looking for. And that's a strong indicator of an information architecture problem. It's also important to understand that what you see superficially is not necessarily the same thing in the underlying system and what brought that system about. So neglecting those hidden parts can harm user experience. Research helps us identify areas to continuously improve. Testing validates a design's effectiveness. And it's really important to know failing early is an important factor. If you know ahead of time where your shortcomings are, you can correct it sooner and suffer fewer losses. So how do you create or improve an existing information architecture? Well, work as a team. You should identify key team roles. And sometimes these roles are overlapping or the same person. So support users are real world users of a system or potential users if that system does not exist. But these are people who have elected to help you develop something because perhaps you have incentivized them or they have some sort of stake in the outcome. But then that brings us to stakeholders, people who quite literally do have a stake in the outcome and the success of what it is that you're building or improving. Subject matter experts, people who understand and can empathize with your audience or may even be part of your audience, but know very deeply the value and the purpose behind something. Information architects, perhaps that's you. User experience designers, user interface designers, not the same thing. Developers and strategists, and this is not comprehensive. So there are three points of information architecture and user experience research. That is who, so typically your users, why, the context, and what, the content. And understanding questions related to these three key areas can help you better understand the purpose and the objectives before coming up with recommended solutions. So how do we do that user research and contextual research and content research? Well, ask questions. Who is your audience? What are their needs, desires, motivations, likes, dislikes, frustrations? Context, why are we building or improving a system? What are the business needs, constraints, assumptions, testable outcomes, measurements that matter? And the content, what information is currently available? How can information be presented to support user needs? How is content managed? Can content change to better suit needs? So it's important to understand that that information architecture and user experience research yields good information architecture. So put information architecture into action. Identify the questions that are most valuable, conduct research, Create diagrams and design artifacts, things that help you visualize something before investing deeper. Gets everybody on the same page and lets people talk. What you think may be consistency and cohesion between your team in terms of ideas may not actually be the case. And visuals help you tease out those differences. Getting everybody on the same page before committing to building something can really help drive to a more effective solution. So facilitate the team and the user exercises. Document your progress as a team. Build something, build early, build small, test it. Use a performance measurement framework to monitor the performance of key performance indicators. Test, learn from what you've realized from testing, and then repeat. 
So let's review some examples from, for research and constructing good information architecture. So for research, with your users, do you know your audience or what they want? So some possible things that may help is cohort analysis. How do people group together? Are these demographics? Are these self-identified groups or collectives? Perhaps provide some user surveys and don't go overboard with these sort of things. Start light, tease out things because you want to be cyclical. Conduct user interviews. Perhaps you do a survey to learn a few things and then you ask questions in an interview setting. Do you understand if your website is effective? Well, try data analysis, prototyping, user testing. Challenge your notions. Validate what it is that you believe to be true. Those are your assumptions. So can you improve user experience and conversion funnels? Well, of course. Try creating user personas. Do some user story mapping. Create some user flows and journey maps. Understand how it is that a person experiences an existing system so that way you can improve. You can do this with prototypes as well if there is no existing system. Are there user needs that we're not aware of? Well, again, try some user surveys, user interviews, and testing. You'll notice that there's a great degree of overlap in answering multiple questions with multiple exercises and research methods. So context, why should we build or improve this website or system? If you're gonna spend money, time, effort doing something, you should know why. Talk to stakeholders, subject matter experts, and the users themselves of the system. How do we know if we're succeeding? Well, do some user testing, do some data analysis, monitor your key performance indicators. If you haven't developed those, that's a great place to start. If you can't define success, you won't know if you're succeeding. How do we understand business needs and limitations? Well, try a process flow, workshops, requirements gathering, Understand what an organization's purpose is. What is their mission? Get to the root cause. And understand limits. How much time do you have? What is the budget for this thing? What happens if we can't meet that? Well, those are questions you need to know before you start. So where do you start and what are the priorities? Well, try some priority mapping, user story mapping and stakeholder meetings. Gather that information early. What impact do other systems have? Well, try system diagrams and integration research. Get a lay of the land a little bit. Understand what it is that you're working with. And it's okay not to be completely comprehensive with this information, but if you don't start somewhere, then you're kind of flying blind. And then the content, the substance. What valuable content exists? Now, maybe this is collateral that your organization has or that your client has, or maybe it's something that other comparables or competitors may have. Just understand what's out there so that way you know that you're not starting from zero. Do a content audit, maybe some analytics review, and repeat this very frequently. How is content managed? Well, talk to stakeholders. Develop a process flow to understand the different points in a process of how content comes from an idea to the point where it's visible to the public published. And do an asset review. What sort of photography do you have? Infographics, what sort of copy do you have? What's available from the marketing team? There are, there are many different resources that you may be at your disposal that you should accrue and at least just be aware of. Where is this stuff? Who owns it? Who manages it? who says that this is old and retired. So what information do users need to see? Well, try wireframing, prototyping, and diagramming. Tease it out a little bit as a team. How can we improve content? Well, try developing a content strategy. Do you have a clear voice and tone? Do you know what sort of words you choose to use that your audience recognizes? Is it consistent across all channels, not just your website or whatever system you're developing, but is it a consistent experience? Because your website doesn't live in a vacuum. I may talk to you. I may have a phone call. I may look at a brochure. I may visit your website. I may attend an event. 
And if that voice and tone is consistent, carrying your brand, that's important. Do some user testing, do some user journey mapping, understand how content plays a role. What value does, does content have? What am I trying to get a person to do? What are they trying to do? So once again, use research to inform design. Information architecture is a design practice. So establish a base understanding, apply what you learn to relevant information architecture points, consider how things could fail or how they could scale. Create initial design concepts that include information architecture considerations. Enter the build, measure, learn loop. This is a concept from a book and a methodology called the Lean Startup. And learning never ends. Be prepared to return to research. Get into these loops of improvement. So let's kind of dive into the different points of information architecture and how it is that we can explore developing these things. Once you've done some of this research, it kind of gravitates into these very similar areas of defining. So how should content be structured? Well, you should have led up to this point and should know enough to at least be able to answer that with a preliminary idea. It's okay, it's not about perfection. It's about effectiveness and a starting point. You're trying to create something. You're trying to let the rubber hit the road build a prototype, build an initial system that can be improved upon. So it's okay, you don't need to be perfect. Excise that idea from your mind. It's just about finding an effective starting point. So what are some helpful content types and what fields do they have? So maybe you have blog posts, maybe you have events, maybe you have bio pages. How are they structured? How is information presented on the page? Is there underlying structure that helps facilitate search and navigation and listing pages? How does that information change from page to page? Is there anything hidden? And that's okay. Sometimes information architecture is hidden, if you recall. Things like taxonomy might not be visible to a user, but might help facilitate search. Are there relationships between content types and other components? So perhaps there's an author on a blog post that goes to a bio page. And then on that bio page, you can see other blog posts or events that they're speaking at. How can content change over time? So for example, an event typically has a life cycle. An event is announced. Maybe there's a call for papers. Maybe there's a registration period. Maybe there's an early bird registration period. Then comes the event itself. Maybe people are bombarding the website with traffic to figure out, okay, what's the schedule? Where should I be? I'm kind of in a hurry. I don't want to have to fiddle with this. I just want the information. But also after an event happens, there may be some information about a previous event, photos, presentations, recordings that helps inform somebody after an event. Maybe I missed a presentation while I was at another one, or it could inform attending a future event. So just think, how does content change over time and how does that play a role in what people are doing with that information? And who can do what with what content? How is content utilized? So there are a few artifacts that you can create to help define content structure. So that's diagrams, a content strategy, priority guides, wireframing, design mockups, prototypes, and an information architecture specification spreadsheet. Again, not comprehensive, but these are just some ideas of how to define content structure. And you'll see some overlap in the following points. Taxonomy, are there natural categories for content? How is taxonomy used on an, an item page or a list page? Does it let me see, okay, this is a press release versus a white paper? or this is a conference versus a webinar? How are these things naturally classified? And does your audience naturally recognize that? What taxonomy helps orient a user within that context that they need to make a decision? Is it just a little label near the title? Is it some sort of indicator in search? Is it a filter? So taxonomy helps really drive things through. What taxonomy could help a user find that content? How can taxonomy be changed over time? So very frequently there are controlled vocabularies like the states in the United States or provinces of Canada. And it would take you know an, an act of government to change that or sometimes war. And your controlled vocabularies are very similar in that sense that 
a lot of times you can detect what exists as opposed to making it up. So what helps make things? And don't go crazy with lists. Too many lists means that you're going to have tons of terms that aren't really used and are tough to manage. Keep it simple. What is the most effective way of classifying things in a way that means something to your audience? So there are a few artifacts that help here too. Again, there's some overlap. So you can do diagrams. If you don't know how things are organized, you can try card sorting. There's both open and closed. And that is a, a, a task that, or an exercise that may involve your users themselves. Do a taxonomy inventory. Figure out how many different ways things can be categorized and then list out what terms make sense. Don't forget, there are preferred terms but there are also synonyms. Don't list out every possible synonym because then you bloat your term list. Have synonyms as a separate portion of what each term is and try to keep it to preferred terms. Content strategy, of course, it makes sense. It helps you understand how it is that you wanna contextualize things and, and classify things. Wireframing, mockups, and prototypes. Again, you wanna see how this stuff actually works in a system. The labeling systems, the words that you choose to use should not just be coming from an internal team unless it's just the internal team using something. These labels need to mean something to an audience. So what does that audience think of? What are their mental models? What words do your users naturally recognize to describe things? What words would annoy them or present possible legal issues? Are there certain off-limit things? And where do we need to be strategic with labels? Is this in the menu system? Is this in search? Is this in search results? Is this on the item page itself to help give them context? So again, artifacts can help you define these labeling systems and you'll see some repetition here. Diagrams, card sorting, tree testing, that certainly can go through things, taxonomy, inventory, content strategy, site map, wireframes, mockups, prototypes. Not comprehensive, but to give you a few ideas of things to tease out what words you choose to use in different areas. Navigation, we all know what a main menu system is, but navigation exists beyond that. Main menu is probably the most important, but there's also secondary navigation, there's footer navigation, supplemental navigation for related products. Sometimes there's sidebar navigation. Don't overwhelm people with too many choices. Divide and conquer. So what are users trying to find? At that moment, in that space, at that point in time, what are they trying to find? That, that answer is going to change depending on where you are. What, what do they want? What do you want users to find? Because that's not the same answer. Maybe that's a discovery issue. Maybe they're just unaware of something and you want to show something to them. How do users interact with navigation? Is that through just a normal main menu? Are there other ways that they can interact? Are there physical buttons? I mean, this may not just be a website. This could be a physical system, kiosk or a dashboard in a car. How many navigation items should there be? Well, typically there's uh, the psychological principle of Miller's law, the magic rule seven plus or minus two. You can look it up. We want to avoid decision fatigue. That is too many choices or the diner menu syndrome. How can options be grouped? And there are exercises to tease out the answer to that question. What is the sequence of the parent and child items? Typically this is done by priority or uh, by importance. So consider artifacts like diagramming, card sorting, tree testing, content strategy, site mapping, wireframes, mockups, and prototypes. And lastly, search strategy. Well, I know if I'm gonna look for oven mitts on Amazon that I'm probably just gonna type it in. I'm not gonna go through the menu system to try to find such a thing. That would be pretty laborious and silly. So how do your users expect to find information? What sort of search filters or facets help users drill down to find what it is that they're looking for in a natural way? And that, that's okay, that can change over time, but where are you starting? That might inform what you do with taxonomy and other content structure. 
can search results be sorted in more than one way? So perhaps I want to sort events in a different way or a directory of people by, al by alphabet or by department. What hidden information can influence search results? So sometimes we actually use hidden keywords to try to influence inner site searches or, or other fields. What, what could bring that about? That's okay. Uh, proximity search is another classic example. I'm not showing people the geocoding that helps triangulate results in a, a proximity for a store location. That's hidden. They're just providing their address and I'm providing them a list of locations within a circle. But that underlying information helps get those results. So again, diagram, do some content strategy work, site mapping, wireframing, mockups, and prototypes. That helps you understand how it is that people can search the site. And if there are multiple steps, perhaps some process flows or, or user journey mapping may come into play. So you might be noticing a trend. The research and artifacts tend to overlap to help define many information architecture points. So plan your efforts, understand what you need to understand the most. What's important and valuable? How can we build something small, something testable to get in front of people to grow it in a natural and effective way? Where are we likely to fail and what can we prepare to learn when we're about to do that? What can we study to see, okay, is this failing? What are our metrics for success in those areas? And where do you need to practice and grow to help this information architecture be more effective. So that's it. Uh, this may have seemed very brief and very light or straightforward, but it's really about capturing how to take theory into operation. So how do you, as someone trying to explore information architecture and the things related to it, well, you want to improve. It's important to understand the learning process and its role in your growth. So at some point you didn't know what information architecture was. <laughs> it was unknown to you. And then you encountered it. Maybe you dive into it a little bit and became a bit more acquainted. Maybe you've truly studied this and read a few books and maybe you're experienced. You've actually practiced this stuff and done something with it. And if you do something long enough, both in study and practice, you can master it. And the length of time that it takes to do that really depends on the subject and how complex it is. So there's an article that you may want to read about the learning process if you're interested. But learning is something that takes different areas. So finding a mentor, someone that does this stuff can really accelerate your learning. It's less trial and error and more guided. Attend social events. Are there any sort of meetups or camps or conferences that you can go to to interact with other people in this field? Can you participate? Can you present? Can you explore things in a social setting? What can you study? What can you practice? Are there good books? Can you practice wireframing or other diagrams? What haven't you done that can really cut your teeth into some familiar ground so you can be more comfortable doing this discuss and present. Consider new tools and techniques. Now, don't go crazy with tools. The tools aren't gonna do the work for you. The work comes from you, the research, the effort, the interacting with the other people. The tools are just a mechanism to bring you to a diagram that you're trying to produce. Or techniques might be different prioritization maps or journey map techniques. And then just repeat, keep doing this if this is an area where you want to continue exploring. There are some other resources that might be of interest. The most common resource referenced is referred to as the Polar Bear book. That is a book from O'Reilly called Information Architecture for the Web and Beyond. There's also a really light read. You probably read this in a weekend, How to Make Sense of Any Mess. Fantastic book. There's some good websites on user experience in general, uh, uxdesign.cc, contentstrategy.com, the Nielsen Norman Group a website, nngroup.com. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. If you have any feedback, feel free to contact me. If you'd like to learn more about information architecture, certainly uh, reach out or follow those resources. Anyway, thank you very much for your time.